Fantastic. Can you turn it off? Excellent, ladies and gentlemen. So, um, uh, in the interest of uh, everyone getting lunch reasonably on time, I will start this uh, next session uh, immediately, and uh, you will not get the benefit of the very uh, eloquent and analytical introductions that my two predecessors provided, Adam Ward and Nick Redman, who I congratulate for the efficiency and elegance with which they chaired the sessions. Instead, I will just remind you uh, prosaically of what the subject of this session is. It's uh, Iran towards an endgame, and it's fair to ask what was intended by this phrase, towards an endgame, and I imagine that when we first designed this plenary session, uh, we were um, hoping to uh, discover if we were close to an endgame, so to speak, in the specific negotiations between uh, the P5 plus one or the EU plus three and Iran on on the nuclear file, and if one was, what was the prospect for ultimately integrating uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran into, as it's uh, usually styled, the, the International Committee of Nations, and what might be the international and geopolitical and geoeconomic prospects of that uh, aspiration being uh, fulfilled. Um, those nuclear negotiations uh, uh, are extended and they're uh, due to uh, 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 be culminating uh, in the month of November. There's a question as to whether they can, and if so, if not, whether they can be yet again uh, prolonged. But in the middle of that, there has been um, uh, further uh, engagement with the reality that Iran uh, is a hugely important and influential actor in the region and even talk about the way in which uh, Iran's uh, role in this uh, battle uh, with ISIL can be either uh, overtly, covertly, publicly or privately acknowledged and, and encouraged. And there's no question that um, uh, the atmosphere of, of um, uh, the nuclear discussion cannot be uh, impeccably se uh, separated from uh, the realities uh, on, on the ground that have become um, more specific uh, with this uh, coalition of the hesitant, but still coalition of the reasonably active in this uh, two-front, multi-front battle against ISIL. So that, I think, is the collection of issues before us, and I will invite the three speakers to speak in the order in which they appear in the program. Uh, Said Hussein Musavian has been uh, part of the national security establishment of the Islamic Republic of Iran, knows well the current uh, president, Hassan Rouhani, with whom he worked, is uh, now a, a research uh, a scholar. We uh, are happy to receive him again on uh, the IISS uh, dais to give uh, an Iranian perspective. Ghassan uh, Salame, a member of the uh, ISS uh, Council Dean of uh, the Paris School of International Affairs, uh, and holder of many uh, official uh, positions, both uh, uh, in his own native country of Lebanon and also uh, in international organizations, including the United uh, Nations, and uh, uh, an astute actor and simultaneously observer uh, or, uh, of the region. Gary Seymour, a former uh, director of studies of the IISS and uh, uh, holder of uh, important government positions, uh, not least uh, the special advisor to President Obama on, on nuclear issues. He was sometimes styled Obama's nuclear guy, uh, and now at the Belfer Center at, at Harvard University, uh, and one of the most uh, articulate observers of, uh, of the region's uh, nuclear uh, issues. So that's our, uh, that's our, those are our three stars, and I'll ask uh, Said Hussein Musebian to kick us off each in about 10 minutes so we genuinely have a possibility of discussion and dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, John. After a decade of failed nuclear talks, the world powers and Iran signed an interim deal on nuclear, the joint plan of action on November 24, 2013. Reasons for the, this first success of engagement were the Iranian presidential election in 2013, Iran-US direct engagement, the U.S. respecting Iran's right to enrichment, impact of sanctions on the Iranian economy, the failure of the world powers to restrain Iran's nuclear program through sanctions and pressures. pressure. Indeed, Iran responded to the sanctions by increasing the number of installed centrifuges to over 20,000, producing over 8,000 kilograms of enriched uranium, increased the level of enrichment from 3.5% to 
20%, developing more advanced centrifuges, producing of fuel pallets for Tehran research reactor, building a second enrichment plant near Fort Doe, protected under the mountains. However, the interim deal has resulted in positive outcome for both parties. Iran has converted much of the 20% in rich uranium into oxide and diluted the remainder to less than 5%. Stopped enriching uranium to over 5%, halted installing additional centrifuges at Natanz and Fordo and components into the Iraq research reactor, has not built new uh, enrichment plants at, the additional loca at additional locations, continued centrifuge R&D in a manner that does not result in accum accumulation of uh, enriched uranium, committed to no reprocessing, provided the IAEA with in enhanced access to its nuclear facility. Actually, the IAEA in its September report reaffirmed that Iran has fulfilled its commitment under the joint plan of action. In return, the EU 3 plus 3 have paused their efforts to further produce, uh, reduce Iran's export of crude oil, lifted sanctions on petrochemical, gold, and other precious uh, metals, sanctions on Iran's auto industry, and blockade of spare parts for Iran's civil aviation, imposed no further nuclear-related UN or US or EU nuclear-related sanctions, established a financial channel to facilitate specific transactions. Now the question is how to bring the nuclear engagement to final success. Iran and the world powers negotiators have made good progress toward a comprehensive deal, actually addressing some key issues, one on Iraq heavy water, second on Fordow enrichment plan, and third on uh, required access by the IAEA inspectors. However, they could not yet agree on comprehensive nuclear deal. As a result, the, the, the talks were extended through November 24th, 2014, and while both sides pledged to continue complying with the condition of the interim deal. As the negotiators resume their talks over Iran's nuclear program in New York, the world powers and Iran face a difficult task to bridge the remaining gaps and reach a comprehensive nuclear deal within the next three months. The most difficult remaining issues are, first, how to define the size and the scope of Iran's nuclear enrichment program. Second, a realistic timetable for sanction removal. The key elements of a comprehensive deal would be the following. One, on Iraq, heavy water. Concerns related to the heavy water reactor at Iraq would be alleviated by technical conversion to reduce its capacity to produce plutonium from 10 kilogram to one kilogram per year. Moreover, Iran would make a long-term commitment to refrain, to refrain from reprocessing. Second, on Fordo. Iran would accept convert Fordo into an R&D center for its centrifuges and, centrifuges and other peaceful nuclear technologies. Third, on transparency measures. Tehran would commit to fully implement the agreed upon transparency measures and enhanced monitoring, including ratifying and implementing the additional protocol. Fourth, on the size and the scope of Iranian uh, enrichment. About the level, Iran would agree to limit the level uh, at, uh, cap the, uh, the level at 5%. About uh, the capacity, how to tailoring the capacity with the practical needs of Iran. The, the, the solution could be as follows. This is the key question now the negotiators are discussing. For a period to be agreed, Iran would maintain a capacity sufficient only for enriching uranium for research reactors fuel. Second, 
Iran would keep its operating enrichment capacity at about the current level, but would begin to phase out its first generation of centrifuges machines in favor of more advanced, higher capacity centrifuges, which would make its enrichment program more cost effective. These measures would create a window of seven to 10 years period for confidence building, which in combination with intr intrusive inspections and monitoring will ensure that Iran can verifiably maintain a peaceful nuclear program with a prolonged timetable for a possible breakout. Five, Iran would receive international cooperation on civil nuclear technologies. Six, Iran, uh, the world powers would remove all nuclear-related sanctions, either multilateral or unilateral or UN sanctions, and ultimately upon the implementation of the final step of the comprehensive pack, uh, agreement, the Iranian nuclear program will be treated the same as that of any non-nuclear weapon state party to the NPT. The regional implication of a nuclear deal with Iran Resolving the Iranian nuclear issue would be a success for both Iran and the world powers. And it could then serve as the basis for a broader agenda for weapons of mass destruction in the Middle East. With a broader vision, the world powers and Iran can agree on a model for Middle East based on six principles. One, no nuclear weapon in the Middle East. Second, ban on reprocessing. Third, no enrichment of uranium beyond 5%. Fourth, no stockpile beyond domestic needs. Five, establishing a regional or international consortium for producing nuclear fuel. And six, implementing regional confidence building and verification measures on WMD non-proliferation by creating a regional authority like Euratom or the Argentine-Brazilian mutual inspection arrangement in charge of regulating nuclear development and verifying in peaceful, uh, its peaceful nuclear uh, nature in the region. The need for Iran-US engagement. The Iranian nuclear issue is political in nature as illustrated by the exaggerated debate over the nature of Iran's nuclear program. The fact? is that the nuclear issue has been aggravated by Iran-US hostilities. And as long as this animosity continues, negotiation on nuclear issue alone will not, will not lead to a peace between Iran and the US. Peaceful resolution to the nuclear issue could, however, open the door for broad dialogue and engagement between Iran and the US. The present policy of nuclear engagement will fail if neither Washington and Tehran has a grand strategy for broad engagement. A comprehensive solution for the two different dimensions of US-Iran relations and nuclear issue is essential. Iran and the US have common interest in the war on terror and peace and stability in the region. Whether they like it or not, they are natural allies in Afghanistan because both capitals are seeking peace and stability in Afghanistan, coupled with the safe exit of American troops at the end of 2014. During 2001, under President Khatami, Iran and the U.S. cooperated to overthrow the Taliban. Furthermore, Iran and the U.S. are natural allies in Iraq, and both have backed the, the previous and the current government in Baghdad. Iran and the U.S. in direct cooperation made the possible the collapse of Saddam Hussein dictatorial regime in 2003. They both, they both opposed the efforts by uh, ISIS. The deep-rooted mistrust between the U.S. and Iran is a major obstacle to direct cooperation in fight mutual, fighting mutual enemies, making it impossible, for example, for Iran Quds Force and the U.S. CENTCOM to partner in war against ISIS. This animosity is why both sides have had to coordinate their respective moves indirectly 
The recent fight over Omerli, Eastern Iraq, has been one of the most important battles against ISIS, where the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Coats Force, alongside with Kurdish Peshmerga fighters, supported the ground attacks while the U.S handled the air strike resulting in uh, defending this strategically located town. President Obama in his address to the nation, of fi uh, to the nation uh, on, f on the fight against ISIS said the American military power is unmatched, but he also confessed that it requires a broad coalition to eradicate a cancer like ISIS. The fact is that without Iran's active participation and cooperation, Washington's international coalition against ISIS will fail. For the same reason, the 2001 coalition against war on terror, on war on terror against Al-Qaeda failed, and the 2011 international coalition on Syria failed. Without Iran, no regional or international coalition aimed at addressing major crises in the Middle East would be successful. It's therefore time for the U.S. and the world powers and the regional actors to engage with Iran and accept Iran's regional power and influence. The need for a transformation in Iran-U.S. broad dialogue from one side and Iran and the regional powers like Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Egypt, and the GCC from the other side is no longer an option, but urgent necessary to halt and reverse the current trajectory toward further sectarianism, extremism, and terrorism spreading throughout the region. In fact, the current crisis in the Middle East, which is embroiled in civil war, sectarian conflict, and the rise of the most dangerous version of terrorism has created a new geopolitical context for the U.S. and Iran and Iran and the regional neighbors to cooperate to restore peace and stability in the Persian Gulf and beyond. Despite the historical mistrust, the two administrations, Tehran and Washington, have been engaged in genuine and serious negotiations on the nuclear issue. And such direct engagement has proved vital to reach the current unprecedented outcome. The achievement thus far in the nuclear negotiation is an indication of what these two sides can attain by engaging directly and more broadly to tackle urgent regional developments. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and in about 10 or 15 minutes, I'm sure we will be able to um, explore in more detail um, the elements of uh, the proposal that you put forward. Gassam Salame, your perspective on these issues. Thank you. Well, I, I certainly uh, agree to a large extent with uh, first the uh, rapid summary of uh, what was agreed in Geneva on November 24th. I also agree with what was said by uh, my colleague, Mr. Musavian, on uh, the progress made on the number of issues, what to do with Iraq, what, uh, how to transform Fordo, etc. I, to a large extent, take note of what Iran would like to see as a final comprehensive agreement. Therefore, I will not go, I'm going to skip this part because I think to a large extent this reflects reality. But let me start where uh, Mr. Musavian ended, that is on what he called the new geopolitical uh, landscape we are having. Because indeed, I agree with the formula, we are having a new geopolitical uh, landscape. And here comes immediately the question. Is this new geopolitical landscape going to help reaching a deal on the nuclear issue, or is it going to prevent it and make it even more complex? And to this basic question, we should all address, I think, if we agree on the one hand that there are still substantial obstacles before reaching an agreement on the nuclear issue, and if we agree also on the other side that there is a new geopolitical landscape in the Middle East, how the two things are going to interact. 
because, and here again, I agree with Mr. Musavian, you cannot ignore it. But this is the beginning of a big uncertainty. Big uncertainty for the geopolitical landscape and big uncertainty for uh, the nuclear negotiation. Because in my modest view, one key factor that has helped reaching the interim agreement, reaching the agreement to extend within the same conditions the November 13 agreement, is the fact that both sides have decided to somehow quarantine, to somehow isolate, to protect, to immunize, call it as you wish, the nuclear negotiations from other issues. And here we are now just doing exactly the opposite. We have to recognize that this firewall that has been established between the technical nuclear negotiations on the one hand and the geopolitical issues on the other hand is falling before our eyes. It's falling before our eyes and we don't know what kind of effect it will have on the negotiations. You may say it is going to speed up the negotiation. And the end game, a positive end game, is now even more reachable, basically because both sides have a common enemy. And in the history of, of the world, having a common enemy has always helped, has always helped. But if you go into the details, you will find that this is not necessarily true. Why isn't that true? Because basically, the geopolitical uh, sort of landscape is not necessarily favorable to Iranian interests. Why is it so? Because basically, the alliance that has been building in order to fight ISIS is viewed with a lot of ambiguity by both sides, fighting what Rola called a min minutes ago, the Cold War in the Middle East. On the one hand, you certainly have the identification of an enemy, but look carefully to how Iraqi Shia militias, Asa al Haq, Muqtar al-Sadr, etc., have said that they will fight against this coalition because it's a new invasion of Iraq. Look very carefully to what Ayatollah Khamenei has to say two, three days ago by saying that he doubts this coalition is going to settle the issue of ISIS. Look to what Ayatollah Sistani yesterday let us know that basically this coalition should be observed very carefully so it is not a new occupation of Iraq. And on the other side, that is the side of those who are, say, anti-Iranian in Iraq, in Syria, and elsewhere. There is the same ambivalence, the same ambivalence, because they would tell you, look, every time America has intervened in that part of the world, that is in Afghanistan in 2001, or in Iraq in 2003, who won the day, after all, it is Iran. So it is going to be the same now, is the new coalition going to fight ISIS and therefore consolidate Iranian influence in Iraq, consolidate Bashar al-Assad's rule in Syria, etc. So we are, despite the fact that everybody is happy that finally we have a common enemy, well, when various actors who disagree on everything happen to find a common enemy, it's always fishy. It's always fishy because it is based on a lot of ambiguity and a lot of ambivalence. In fact, everybody is trying to use ISIS to his own interest. And ISIS is also something, and the fight against ISIS is something that everybody is going to fight with a lot of conditions and a lot of a priori. On the one hand, people would like to fight ISIS in order to consolidate a certain geopolitical landscape that has emerged from the past 10 years, which was very favorable to Iran. And on other side, you have clear forces who would like to fight ISIS in order to revisit that landscape and therefore to 
uh, sort of uh, uh, look uh, at it again. Therefore, I'm really worried for these uh, nuclear negotiations because if it's their isolation from all this has been a key to their success so far, or at least to reaching the agreement in November 2013, and to a real chance of reaching a permanent agreement, which I don't dismiss, despite all the uh, sort of uh, uh, statements on, bo on, on both sides, I do believe that, unfortunately, domestic issues in America with the elections uh, in November, but also in Iran, where there is a clear uh, front where the public opinion is certainly attached to the nuclear pro uh, program, but also attached to an agreement, but their representatives would like to have an agreement that the government can say was a victory and not was a sort of uh, a, co a catastrophe or a compendium of concessions. On the other hand, the regional, uh, the regional geopolitical picture, as we see it now, is at the same time, helpful, Amerli, you mentioned Mr. Musavian, is a good example of parallel sort of action, not necessarily coordinated, but parallel action in order uh, to sort of uh, break uh, the, the encirclement of that, uh, of that city. But on the other hand, on the other hand, there are issues in Syria, in Yemen, in Gaza, and certainly in Iraq itself, where the interests of the two parties, that is America and, and Iran, are not necessarily easily coordinated or easily sort of uh, uh, put, uh, put together. Therefore, if the quarantining of the technical issues has been a key, now we have to recognize first that this firewall that has been built is crumbling and that the issues are being more complex. Second, that it does not go into one direction, like making reaching an agreement more difficult or making it easier. In fact, we have good reasons to make the case for both uh, the, two, the two outcomes. And three, that to a large extent, a deal is still possible. Therefore, I do believe that at least one thing we should keep in mind, despite the fact that we keep hearing that war is still on the table. My own personal view is that war is now less likely. Less likely because nobody has a clear interest in adding a new war to the Gaza war and the war going on in Syria and in Iraq and elsewhere. A war against Iran that would be, again, isolated from the other wars is becoming absolutely impossible. Now, if there is a war against Iran, it means that the whole region, the whole conflicts in the region are going to be communicating with each other, and nobody certainly wants that. So what other alternative do we have? Although everybody doesn't want a new extension after November the 14th, this is not something that you should rule out entirely. This is a clear possibility in my mind. And it will not be facilitated, neither by new sanctions, nor by a new uh, sort of maximalist demands on the Iranian side. So war, war, in my view, is less likely. The fact that everybody doesn't want an extension is not something that I'm convinced of. Or the third, which is uh, basically going back to what we were. If we go back to what we were, that is a race for more centrifuges on the one hand and more sanctions on the other hand, expect many players in the region to look elsewhere for help. And in fact, to look in particular towards Pakistan. And keep in mind the possibility that this is before us. So that's why I don't think we are at an end game. I do believe that the deal is still possible and that a deal is definitely desirable. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Gary Seymour. Thank you, John. <clears throat> well, I'm going to focus, as John suggested. Thank you, John.
I'm going to focus, as John suggested, on the prospects for completing a comprehensive agreement by the deadline of November 24th of this year. Uh, since the extension of the Joint Plan of Action in July, uh, the good news is that the negotiators have established a much more sensible and efficient process for negotiation. Instead of holding a series of big, formal, multilateral P5 plus 1 meetings uh, with Iran, there's been much greater shift toward a series of bilateral meetings including two extended bilateral meetings between the full U.S. Uh, and the full Iranian teams uh, in Geneva in August and September. And this is important because the P5 plus 1 format is far too cumbersome for any real negotiation. They're much more ceremonial sessions. Any deal will have to be struck between Washington and Tehran and then ratified by the P5 plus 1 and ultimately the UN Security Council. So this new process is encouraging, and this process is continuing in New York this week with a series of bilateral U.S.-Iranian meetings, and then next week we'll have a full ceremonial meeting of the P5 plus 1 at the foreign minister's level. Um, unfortunately, the two sides, and I'm going to just talk about the U.S. and Iran as the two key parties in this negotiation. Unfortunately, the U.S. and Iran are still very far apart on the fundamental issue, which is Iran's status as a nuclear weapons threshold state. And by that I mean its physical capacity to produce weapons-grade uranium, which is translated into technical details of its enrichment program such as the numbers and types of centrifuges, stockpile of low enriched uranium, restrictions on research and development, levels of enrichment, uh, and so forth. The U.S. is demanding that Iran significantly reduce its existing capacity, which is equal to about 10,000 of the first generation IR-1 centrifuge machines, and to maintain these restrictions for up to 20 years. Uh, in other words, this would take away Iran's physical ability to quickly produce large quantities of weapons-grade uranium. Um, Iran, on the other hand, has rejected any reduction of its current enrichment capacity and insists on building to a much larger industrial scale program after only a few years. We all know Supreme Leader Khamenei has directly and personally um, engaged on this question, citing a very large number um, you know, of enrichment capacity, 190,000 SWU, which is a technical unit, uh, as, the, as the ultimate objective of Iran's program. Now, I can imagine a compromise uh, between these two positions that would require very difficult and very painful concessions on both sides. But as far as I can see, neither side feels compelled to make these difficult concessions. Uh, the Supreme Leader appears to believe that the Ukraine crisis and the rise of ISIL has weakened and distracted the United States and therefore puts less pressure on Iran to make difficult nuclear concessions. And he also seems to believe that Iran's economy which is stabilized under the much more competent management team of President Rouhani, is better equipped to withstand a resumption of sanctions should the nuclear talks fail. By the same token, I see no sign that President Obama would accept a bad deal from an American standpoint that would allow Iran to retain or develop a significant enrichment capacity. Such an agreement would badly damage U.S. strategic interests, deeply upset U.S. allies in the region, and face very strong resistance from Congress. Uh, the administration also believes that if the talks collapse, the U.S. will be in a very good position to increase pressure on Iran, because the current oil market, with uh, growing supply and with, um, um, uh, um, um, uh, and with reduced demand, will make it easier for the U.S. to put pressure on Iran's oil exports without triggering price increases. So at this stage, given the calculation of both sides, it's very difficult to imagine a comprehensive agreement emerging by the end of November. And as we near the deadline, 
Both sides will try to maximize their bargaining leverage by putting forward proposals so they appear reasonable, uh, and by threatening to break off the talks uh, if the other side uh, doesn't accept uh, these new ideas. Uh, nonetheless, I think both Washington and Tehran probably prefer to avoid a collapse of the talks. The status quo is not perfect, but it's tolerable. Uh, for Iran, the joint plan of action has provided a respite from additional sanctions so Iran can stabilize its economy, but without having to sacrifice its nuclear program. For the U.S., the current agreement freezes or limits most of Iran's nuclear program, but without sacrificing the overall sanctions regime. Um, in addition, and uh, uh, you know, here my colleague Dr. Salome went into great detail, but it seems to me that to the extent that both sides have an interest um, in um, at least tacitly cooperating to defeat ISIL, they will both want to avoid tensions over the nuclear issue that, that would jeopardize that cooperation. Uh, so I, you know, I agree with Dr. Salome that the, that the rise of ISIL doesn't necessarily make a nuclear deal more or less likely, but it makes it more likely that both sides will want to at least keep the negotiations going in the absence of a deal. And finally, for purely diplomatic reasons, it'll be difficult for either Washington or Tehran to walk away from the table if the other side is prepared to continue because the other P5 plus 1 countries will want to keep the status quo. They'll want to keep the negotiations going, and neither Washington nor Tehran want to, we want to be blamed for causing a new nuclear confrontation. So I expect that the U.S. and Iran will ultimately uh, look at options uh, to extend the negotiations with a new interim or partial agreement, uh, and presumably the quid pro quo in this new agreement, like the current agreement, would involve some additional nuclear actions on the part of Iran in exchange for some additional sanctions relief by the U.S. and Europe and would set a new deadline for completing a comprehensive agreement. Um, uh, my friend Dr. Musavian has already indicated there's been substantial progress on a number of issues and one could imagine a new interim agreement that um, that would codify progress on those issues, like conversion of ARAC or the Fordow uh, facility in exchange for some additional sanctions relief. Now, of course, any new interim deal would face resistance within the U.S. Congress and among U.S. allies in the Middle East if it gives away too much sanctions relief and doesn't get enough uh, nuclear concessions. And I presume a new interim agreement would be resisted by some in Iran for the opposite reason, if it gives away too much nuclear capacity and doesn't get enough sanctions relief. At this point, I think it's premature to speculate on whether the two sides can agree on a new interim agreement that will pass political muster in both capitals, or whether at the end this will fail and the talks will return to the previous cycle of escalating sanctions and escalating nuclear activities. So to conclude, it seems to me that neither Washington nor Tehran are prepared to make the fundamental concessions necessary for a nuclear deal. The U.S. is not prepared to accept Iran as a nuclear weapons threshold state in terms of its physical capacity to produce enriched uranium, and the Islamic Republic is not prepared to give up its long-sought nuclear weapons option. At the same time, I think both sides probably prefer to maintain the status quo if they can. And as I said, I expect that an effort will be made to try to negotiate a new interim agreement. Even if this effort fails, however, um, and Iran uh, resumes its nuclear activities that are currently frozen, I don't think that means Iran will soon have nuclear weapons because Iran's options to produce nuclear weapons are very severely constrained by technical and political factors and by the risk of provoking a, 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 a war with the United States. And I also think that even if the U.S. resumes its campaign to increase sanctions on Iran, the U.S. propensity for attacking Iran is also very limited. Uh, for the reasons that Dr. Salome said, as long as Iran doesn't, take, doesn't make an overt effort to acquire nuclear weapons. In other words, whether or not the current 
um, interim agreement survives does not mean that we're heading for a severe crisis over the nuclear issue. So in other words, I think the nuclear issue is likely to remain, um, uh, either way, um, it's likely to remain unresolved for the, for the foreseeable future. So to answer the question before the panel, are we heading toward an end game, I think the answer is no. Thank you very much. Uh, it, it's always helpful to have uh, uh, clear conclusions. Um, I'll now open it up and uh, take uh, uh, a number of interventions before asking the panel to make their final comments. Obviously, ideas for cunning compromises that allow for a satisfactory extension of the nuclear negotiations or even their happy conclusion are welcome, as are ideas on how the geopolitical situation now interacts with that specific transaction. So, Jean-Louis Jagrin first, and keep your nameplates up as he speaks, and I'll take your names down. Jean-Louis. Yes, uh, I would like to ask uh, questions to Dr. Moussavian that are di directly uh, driven by the very important point by uh, Hassan uh, on the end of the insulation between nuclear issues and overall geopolitical, uh, geopolitical context and uh, Gary Samos point about the Washington situation. And I have in fact uh, two questions. First question uh, is, is Iran considering trying to improve its, uh, uh, I would say, relations, explicit relations in what case, implicit relations in the other case with respectively Saudi Arabia and Israel. Because it's pretty clear that the continuous hostility of Israel and Saudi Arabia to a nuclear settlement will not facilitate things, to put it mildly, in Washington. So can some kind of detente on the major issue with Saudi Arabia and of a continuous conflict with Israel could be, could be expected to facilitate the acceptance of a nuclear settlement in Washington. And the second question is pretty simple. Do you see any f impact of the Ukrainian-Russian crisis on the way uh, the uh, Iranian nuclear issue is dealt in Tehran? Some kind of Russian feedback, I would say. Thank you. And from uh, Jordan Ayman Safadi. Thank you. Um, to the point that Dr. Salam raised about the separation between the nuclear talks and, and the regional context, uh, I'd like to suggest that that separation never existed, and hence the relative uh, success that we had. Uh, they were linked in the way that Iran needed uh, 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 some sort of uh, breakthrough uh, from the pressure that it's being subjected to, so that it can focus on the investment it has made in the region in terms of Iraq and Syria and Hezbollah and all that's happening. So Ir Iran, in a way, leveraged uh, its ability to make a concession on the nuclear uh, issue so that it will be able to focus on, on, on addressing what it considers to be a more vital interest at this moment because the nuclear program could always be reenacted five, six, seven, ten years from now. And now with ISIS uh, into the picture, I think uh, Iran would be able to leverage that as well, and therefore I think its policy would be to drag the negotiations uh, to make sure that they continue for as long as it needs to and get the benefits that come from that. And the West, on the other hand, will have really nothing or very little to leverage because, again, war is not a prospect and nobody's, you know, there's no option to, to disengaging. And to the point that Mr. Mossadian just uh, pointed about all previous attempts have, have failed in the region because Iran was not involved. I'd like to submit to you, sir, that there is an opportunity now for Iran to be involved in the fight against ISIS. Uh, Iran did play a role in creating the environment that allowed for ISIS to, 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 to come about by supporting uh, the Syrian regime and supporting the sectarian war he's raising, and also by supporting sectarian politics in Iraq. Now, nobody wants a, a military role from Iran in fighting ISIS. Now, would Iran be willing to contribute to defeating this terrorist threat by uh, shifting its policies by uh, uh, changing its position in Syria, and uh, which is really prolonging the crisis and creating that shift between uh, Sunni and Shia. And would it also support an all-inclusive government in Iraq, which Dr. Saleh pointedly said is the only way to ensure that uh, ISIS does not come about uh, in the future? Thank you. Thank you. And from the United States, former ISIS council member, President of Iran Corporation, Jim Thompson. Well, his last question was much better than mine. But I do want to address uh, 
One to, uh, to Gary. Um, you mentioned a couple of times the Congress uh, and it's what would be acceptable to the Congress. I, I, is there any deal at all that is acceptable to the Congress? Um, especially, I mean, even after, well, even with this Congress, let alone after the election, especially if, uh, if, if uh, Netanyahu says it's not a good deal, which he'll say to anything. And from Japan, Maida-san. Uh, yes, um, my question is going to Gary. Um, now, on the impact of the, uh, this deal to the regional nuclear uh, plants, uh, such as the uh, uh, Saudis and Turkeys and others, the uh, uh, either an interim new, new interim agreement or more comprehensive the packages that the consequence is that Iran with a limited capability of the enrichment uranium. So that there are two different standards now the United States is going to accept. One is on the case of the UAE, the no capabilities of enrichment. The other one is Iran with the limited capabilities. So that's what's going on to the uh, newly uh, introducing country like uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and others, at how they can interpret the uh, outcome of this deal. Dina Svandri from the ISS. Dina. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to ask a question about Iran's uh, possible military dimensions. So after successive IAEA reports saying that Iran has been implementing the deal, um, the interim deal in good faith, the, there's been a new IAEA report that's saying that Iran hasn't necessarily been forthcoming on its uh, PMDs. So I'd like to ask why the sudden change of mind re-transparency on the Iranian side um, is this going to be a deal breaker for the talks? Um, and should it, in fact, even be part of the um, part of the negotiations? Thank you, Mr. Whitney. Thank you, uh, Nick Whitney, European Council on Foreign Relations. Um, I think my question's actually been asked twice already, and it's 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 for Dr. Seymour, and it's. Um, uh, you said you could envisage some extremely difficult compromises that the two principal parties might conceivably come together on, but then you mentioned a couple of times the Congress and US allies in the region. So, I mean, is the reality that Israel has a, a veto over the outcome of this negotiation? Thank you. Mr. Chalyu. Uh, thank you. Uh, first Deputy Minister, uh, former First Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine. I'm sure everybody agrees that the Ukrainian crisis have a very concrete non-proliferation dimension. Ukraine was a country which possessed that atomic stock pile in, after independence. We refused it against insurance under Budapest Memorandum. My question to all of the speakers, what do you think what the influence of refusal of P5 countries, nuclear countries, to insurance Ukrainian territorial integrity and sovereignty under Budapest obligations on Iranian nuclear case? Thank you very much. Well, we'll come back to the panel and we'll conclude with their remarks. I'll do it in this order. Uh, Hossein Mosevian first, three minutes, then Gary Seymour, three minutes, and then uh, two minutes of uh, conclusion from uh, Ghassan Salome. Hossein Mosevian. First, on Iran's intention for a better relation with Saudi Arabia, my answer is yes. Iran definitely is looking for a, a, a better relation with GCC and specifically with Saudi Arabia. About Israel, I believe Iran would escape the possibility of military confrontation with Israel. Iran doesn't like to go to that situation. Israelis also, I believe, they, do, they won't go that far. Iranians also, they would like uh, to escape unnecessary hostili hostilities, but whether they would go for rapprochement with Israel, I say no. On Ukraine, um, uh, I think there is a very important uh, outcome for Iran because now Russians, they understand what does mean the sanctions, and it's good. Russian official uh, uh, just three weeks ago uh, publicly said, now we understand Iranians, why they were uh, opposing the sanctions. That's why I believe even in the case of failure of talks, Russia and even China, 
uh, they would not be ready to escalate uh, the crisis by increasing the sanctions. Uh, whether ISIS is the result of Iranian policy, to be frankly speaking, ISIS is the result of foreign intervention in Syria. And Iranians, they have been fighting from the beginning the uh, armed opposition in Syria. And you know West and the U.S. regional allies, they supported financially and weaponry the, the armed uh, opposition. And the result is... The, the strengthening the power of al-Qaeda, the creation of ISIS, and even if they can defeat ISIS today, we don't know whether another uh, uh, extreme terrorist group would be created under other names. Uh, whether Iran has a chance to fight ISIS or not, I believe being uh, a member of coalition or not being a member of coalition, Iran would fight against ISIS. In a way, Iran believes the way. I mean, the, the, there is different strategy how to fight ISIS. And Iranians, they would follow to fight ISIS in do, the, the, their own strategy. On PMD and the IAEA, uh, see... What's that strategy, by the way? Iranians, they believe, rely more on the, the, the people of Iraq, including the Sunnis and mobilizing, organizing uh, the, the, the people of Iraq to go to fight against uh, uh, ISIS. But the US and even France, they are counting too much on air strike and uh, not too much on the ground. Uh, on PMD, uh, you should uh, recognize the fact that uh, legally, internationally, the maximum expectation the P5 plus 1 can have from Iran on transparency measures is additional protocol. We don't have anything beyond. Currently, just as a goodwill, Iran is giving access to the IAEA within the framework of additional protocol. For PMDs, the IAEA would need access beyond additional protocol, which there is no international rules and regulations to define the access beyond additional protocol. To my understanding, this is not Iranian official position because I'm not in the government. To my understanding, if there is a final deal, then as a goodwill, Iran would be prepared to give access beyond additional protocol, but for a specific period, to remove the, the questions on uh, uh, PMDs, but not forever. I just want to mention my last point with, I defer with Gary. I believe Gary, even if there is a failure in the talks, I really do not believe the US would be in previous position to orchestrate international new sanctions against Iran. Not because of Ukraine. Because Europeans, they don't like too much uh, confrontation with Iran. And the, 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 the international community now understand one big reality, Gary, that by the international rules, IAEA rules, NPT rules, you can expect Iran sa to, to implement safeguard, safeguard agreement, additional protocol, and subsidiary arrangement. Today, Iran is ready to implement fully. Whatever Iran has already given in the negotiation are all beyond NPT. Capping at 5% is concession Iran has given beyond NPT. Capping the stockpile of enriched uranium is beyond NPT. Making technical conversions in heavy water of Iraq to bring 10 kilogram to one kilogram, which Iran is ready, is beyond NPT. Having Fordo as not as enrichment site, having uh, Fordo as R&D is beyond NPT. All major concessions, even Gary, to today are beyond NPT. Therefore, when Iran is so ready and has a goodwill to implement the maximum level of transparency measures based on international rule and even go beyond NPT, then I don't believe the U.S. would be able to impose more sanctions. Gary Seymour. Oh, let me uh, make four quick points. Uh, first, I think uh, that the Ukraine crisis has had a profound effect 
on the P5 plus 1 negotiations with Iran because, as I suggested, the uh, tensions, divisions between Russia and the Western countries has given Iran much more confidence, as we just heard Dr. Mousavian say, that in the event that the talks collapse, the U.S. and the European powers will not be able to reconstruct a strong sanctions uh, system, and therefore Iran is much, feels much less compelled to, make, uh, to meet the demands that the U.S. Uh, and the Europeans are making. So I think that the Ukraine crisis, which nobody wanted, has in fact made the prospects of a nuclear deal acceptable to the U.S. and to Europe much less likely. Second point, is several people, John Thompson and others, asked me about Congress. Now, of course, Congress does not have a single view. As you all know, there are 535 foreign ministers uh, uh, you know, in Congress, and they have many different views, uh, not just partisan. Also views as congressmen have looked at this issue and tried to understand it. My sense from talking to uh, a number of congressmen and staff is that if a nuclear deal substantially reduced Iran's nuclear capacity, and here I'm sort of the benchmark is if it pushed Iran's ability to produce a significant quantity of weapons grade uranium back to a year or more and kept that restriction in place for close to 20 years, I don't think Congress would overturn an agreement. In other words, I think such an agreement, even though it wouldn't achieve zero enrichment, would have enough support in Congress, and in Israel for that matter, that the agreement would not be challenged. Now, as I suggested, I don't think Iran is prepared to agree to those terms, so the issue is moot. In terms of the extension, I think there's been a very interesting shift uh, the last time I was in Israel and in my conversations with members of Congress all of the fear that accompanied um, um, the you know, announcement of the Joint Plan of Action in November, people have actually come to recognize that the Joint Plan of Action is working. Iran is complying with the various requirements to freeze or limit its nuclear program and allow additional IAEA access, and the sanctions re uh, regime has remained intact, even though there has been some easing. So I think in both Israel and in Congress, you would not see the same um, fear um, about an extension, if that's where we end up, especially if the extension includes substantial additional nuclear constraints in exchange for some limited, um, uh, you know, more sanctions relief. That doesn't mean it won't be opposed. That doesn't mean people won't say things to criticize it. But is it sustainable? I think yes, if the terms of the agreement are better than the current situation. Um, finally, um, I was asked, uh, Mr. Tadashi asked me, if an agreement, if there is an agreement that allows Iran to have limited enrichment program, should we expect to see other countries in the region follow suit? I think the answer is yes. Even if Iran is allowed, I mean, is agreed to have a nominal enrichment capacity for its civilian program, which is justified in terms of its civilian program, we have to expect that Saudi and Turkey and Egypt and others will claim the same right. Whether they'll be able to actually carry that out, of course, is a different matter because someone would have to provide them with the technology. None of the major suppliers will. I'm not sure Pakistan is prepared to do that again. But uh, yes, I think one price of a nuclear deal with Iran that allows enrichment is that we're likely to see other countries uh, pursue that same capability. And it would be very difficult for the U.S. to say to Turkey or Saudi, you can't have an enrichment program for your civilian um, nuclear power program, even though we've accepted that Iran can. I think that's an unsustainable position. Thank you. Yes, sir. <laughs> An unsustainable position that will not be sustained. In fact, I think it is not only likely, it's to a certain extent inevitable, that if the major re rationale behind the right to enrichment put on the table by the Iranians is that they don't rely, they can't rely on the international market to give them the fuel, well, this is an argument that can be taken and used by anybody and expected to be that way. In the 
in terms of the relationship between the nuclear negotiations and the geopolitical problems we are facing in that part of the world. I would say that three, three different episodes have gone before us. The first one was, yes, as Ayman Safadi said, an implicit taken into consideration of geopolitical issues by the two sides. Basically, the Americans were saying, while negotiating with Iran, what would be acceptable to Israel or not, but not explicitly saying so. And on the other side, the Iranians were thinking that they were in a very strong regional position uh, after a decade of uh, scoring a number of points all over the region. Now, we shifted a few months ago into a second stage, and this second stage is the explicit taken into consideration of geopolitical issues. We, they started discussing some of these issues in Vienna and certainly in Geneva and more recently in different places. And what I am worried about is to go to the third level, which our uh, old patriarch uh, Henry Kissinger called once the linkage, that is, when you started saying, give me more 1% more in enrichment and I recognize this for you in Iraq or uh, uh, whatever else. If we go into the linkage, we are in trouble. Why are we in trouble if we go into linkage? And we are sliding slowly into that. We are not yet at that, but we are sliding into that. Why would we be in trouble? For two reasons. The first is that there are convergence of American and Iranian interests on certain issues. Afghanistan, for sure. This, the, the war against ISIS, for sure. But there are very serious points of divergence in the region between the two sides, or at least between Iran and America's allies in Syria, in Yemen, in Bahrain, and elsewhere. So there are points of convergence, but there are more numerous points of divergence. And second, because in order to do the linkage, you need to have, to a certain extent, a similar reading of the balance of power in the region. And my reading, my personal reading, is that before the Arab Spring, Iran was doing inroads in most of the region. Since the Arab Spring, as Shu Enlai once said, it is too er about the French Revolution, it is too early to decide who's going to win it. For the time being, I see no regional winner in this Arab, so-called Arab Spring upheavals. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, nine speakers, uh, three subjects. It's been a, a fantastic morning. Thank you, all of you, for addressing us and for your contribution to discussion. Lunch is now available in the same large room in which uh, breakfast was served. I remind you that the special sessions that are off the record begin at 3 o'clock, and I advise you by 2.45 to be aware of exactly what room you're migrating to because the special sessions are on two or three different floors here. There'll be many people from the ISS staff to guide you to the right place. Uh, please do go to the special session that you signed up for or to which you've been assigned. Thank you very much and see you again collectively uh, at uh, dinner tonight. Thank you. Thank you.